folks, welcome back to Dub After. This is Chris once again. Hello, folks, and welcome back to in Chris White Africa here on the Daba Africa channel. Today is the 20th May 2021. A few technical snafus there as we started the stream. Let's get to in Daba Africa news of the day, the headlines from across Africa and outside the wider world. Start off with South Africa, where South Africa's central bank has held the benchmark interest rate steady for the fifth straight meeting. The repurchase rate in South Africa will remain at 3.5%. All five panel members for the second time in a row voted to hold the rate steady and make no changes. Has the African National Congress begun to subvert democracy with the Independent Electoral Commission now investigating whether it will be safe to conduct the 2021 municipal elections? Will the elections be put off illegally by the African National Congress based on an independent investigation by the Independent Electoral Commission? Very disturbing signs of things underway and afoot in South Africa, ladies and gentlemen. The wildly unpopular, massively failing, tone-deaf, race-based African National Congress is searching for ways to prevent an election in which it's very likely that it will lose control of virtually every major municipality in South Africa. Very disturbing news, folks. Meanwhile, speaking of elections, assuming they go forward, former Johannesburg mayor and former mayor, uh, member of the Democratic Alliance, Herman Mashaba, has thrown his hat in the ring to run under the banner of Action SA for mayor of Johannesburg in the 2021 municipal elections. The former mayor is likely to pull, pull a lot of numbers simply based on name recognition. Also, the fact that he did a reasonably good job as the mayor of Johannesburg. But of course, he left the Democratic Alliance in a bit of, um, how shall we say it, recent mercantilism, gamesmanship that was going on. We'll see what happens with Herman Mashaba as he throws his hat in the ring. In another news in Johannesburg, Johannesburg becomes the latest municipality in South Africa seeking to untether itself from the unreliable, corrupt, venal patrons machine known as ESCOM, the state power utility, which is hampering South Africa's economic development and destroying its economy. Not to mention the impact it's having on vaccination storage for those seeking to be vaccinated in the midst of a pandemic. Joe Berg seeks to get untethered from ESCOM, following Cape Town's example and others. And the Financial Mail writes an op-ed about the Heineken bid to buy Distill, and they're really just putting lipstick on a pig. More on that story shortly. Congratulations, take a lot. South Africa's Amazon wannabe is 10 years old. And they have 50% sale going on. So check it out, folks. Take a lot, 50% sale. Zimbabwe, with a bumper maize crop, is hoping to make $709 million off the sale of its grain to private markets. That would represent $60 billion Zim dollars on the current currency they have there. And Namibia abstains from a vote on the right or the responsibility to protect resolution that was before the United Nations. Namibia abstains. 15 nations, 115 voted in favor, 15 voted against, and Namibia abstained. More to t on that topic shortly. No sanctions for Chad, where an illegal government has assumed control of the country after the combat fatality of the former president, Idris Debe. His 37-year-old son, a major general in the Chadian forces, has been appointed as president for a military government that is expected to last at least 18 months in an illegal power grab which the African Union sent a fact-finding mission to Njamina to find out what was going on. They've come back to the African Union, and the African Union has decided to take no action, no sanctions against Chad, subverting the will of the people. Congratulations to Cameroon, which celebrates its national today, national day today. And Uganda Airlines, purportedly suffering from corruption and scandals, mismanagement, barely two years into his existence. The United States has condemned the appointment of former warlord Prince Johnson to head of the Senate Committee on the Armed Forces in Liberia. And the so-called New Deal for Africa is just a bunch of hot air and palaver. Illegal aliens continue to invade the Spanish enclave of Saita in North Africa. Over 8,000 in one day alone. Escalating violence in Burkina Faso is keeping children from attending schools and hampering life there. And the British Broadcasting Corporation apologizes for its deceitful practices in getting an interview with the former Princess Diana. And in rugby news from this past weekend, Old Glory DC, in an interesting game, defeated the Seattle Seawolves 22-18 at Sagerfield and Leesburg. 
We'll have reports on that as well. Those are the headlines from today, the 20th of May, 2021, folks. Thanks for tuning in. We'll get now to in-depth analysis and commentary on these news events from Africa and around the world. Right out of the gate, let's talk about South Africa keeping its interest rate steady at 3.5%. South Africa holds key rate looking through temporary consumer price index surge. The Monetary Policy Committee kept the repurchase rate at 3.5%. Governor Lesetia Kangango said Thursday in an online briefing, the decision by the five members of the panel was unanimous, the same as it was in March. These are the previous votes. You can see that in March of 2020, they all voted to increase it by a full 100 basis points. And the same in April of last year. So 2% they raised it. In May, there was a dispute, but it was still raised. In July, they were split, but still raised. But finally, in September, they stopped raising the rate, which was stupid. They should have stopped this in March of last year with the pandemic looming. This also harmed South Africa's economy, not just the mismanagement by the National Coronavirus Command Council. Inflation is above the benchmark rate for the first time in five years and expected to be averaging 4.2% this year. And this is not a reflection of strength in the economy, but a reflection of weakness in the economy. Will the 2021 municipal election scheduled for the 27th of October take place in South Africa? That is the question. That's a question many have been asking for well over a year. As many anticipate, the ANC will try to find whatever mechanism it can to unconstitutionally postpone or cancel the elections and subvert the will of the people. If an election were held right this minute, the African National Congress would lose every municipality, maybe even Durban and Bloemfontein. There's no doubt about it, folks. No doubt about it. They are wildly unpopular for their hysterical reaction to the pandemic, their failed policies, their destruction of the economy, over 3 million jobs lost, billions of dollars of personal wealth lost, homes repossessed, businesses have gone under, prospects are weak, people have committed suicide from depression, child molestation, gender-based violence, suicides, all up. Why? Because South Africa's draconian policy was not the right answer to the pandemic. No doubt about that. Meanwhile, what's going on with the Independent Electoral Commission? Dehang Motseneke is to lead an urgent review to determine if municipal elections could even be free and fair. Why wouldn't they be free and fair? Former Deputy Chief Justice uh, Mosaneke has been tasked by the Independent Electoral Commission with investigating whether conditions for the 2020 local government elections will be free and fair. Speaking in a virtual meeting on Thursday, the 20th, Mashinini told Mosaneke will lead a process to review whether the current conditions are conducive or not to holding the free and fair elections later this year. More recently, it's emerged that the various political parties are divided on whether the upcoming local government elections can be free and fair within the context of the ongoing pandemic, he explained. Previously, the Nkata Freedom Party called for one-off postponement of the election due to the pandemic. As far back as October, the Economic Freedom Party asked elections to be postponed and syncing them with the national elections in 2024. Now, see, what's at play here, folks, is an effort to wipe out the ability of opposition parties to compete effectively. And the Economic Freedom Party are so stupid that they fell for this. They seem to think that they'll grow in popularity by 2024, that they'll be a power broker. But the reality is this. No more than 38% of the eligible voters bother to show up for municipal elections. Typically, it's 31% or so, maybe 35%. One in three eligible voters show up. Why can't one in three eligible voters show up in an election this year? This is smoke and mirrors. It's an effort to subvert the will of the people. And it's shameful and disgraceful. In Cotta Freedom Party, very disappointing they made that pronouncement. Not surprising by the economic freedom fighters, although they're not bright enough to realize they cut their own throat. By moving the elections to the same year as the national elections, you just wipe out. You water down this election. There's no fervor. There's no attention. There's no focus on governance at the municipal level, which is what the totalitarians want. They want you to just have a you know rubber stamp vote and just vote a single party instead of voting on issues and candidates. And see, that's how they win. Do not allow this, South Africa. This is a clear effort to undermine your country. If you don't think it is, you're not paying attention. You are not paying attention. If South Africa postpones, delays its elections in 2021, they should be struck in from the rolls of the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. They already should be off of it for their, their lack of respect for property rights with the expropriation without compensation amendment being tabled. They should be removed from that. They should also be called out as a pariah state that undermines democracy. There is no valid excuse whatsoever. All necessary safety protocols can be taken for an election in which only one-third of the eligible voters will bother to show up in the first place. The odds are the numbers will be even lower. So easy enough to provide safety measures from a medical and scientific standpoint, but not from a political standpoint because they know they'll lose, and that's what this is all about. 
Well, assuming these elections take place on the 27th of October, the race mercantilist himself, Herman Mashaba, former Democratic Alliance mayor of Johannesburg, just two years removed from his resignation when he came out with a bizarre accusations about race in the party when he held one of the most powerful positions in the party and was elevated based on his so-called business acumen, a very disappointing commentary from Herman Mashaba when he left the party, but he wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. Musi Maimani did the exact same thing. Uh, when people fail, they call others names. Well, Herman Mashaba has thrown his hat in the ring as an independent candidate for Action SA to be mayor of Johannesburg. Given his name recognition and his relatively decent performance as mayor, he's likely to poll well, if not win the whole thing. We shall see. If Mashaba wins in Johannesburg, that would be a major blow to both the ANC and the Democratic Alliance, both of whom have hopes of capturing the mayor's position in the next election outright. Less than two years after his resignation as DA member and mayor of Johannesburg, Herman Mashaba announced his mayoral candidacy for the city of Johannesburg. He said it was motivated by many Johannesburg residents who want to see him back. I've been under tremendous pressure the last few months from people on the ground in the city of Johannesburg who said, Mashaba, please stand. Today, I'm putting my name forward to serve you, the residents of Johannesburg, once more. And once you give me the mandate, I will resume the work of bringing real change to the people of Johannesburg. He said his party won't contest all 278 municipalities during the 27 October local government elections, but it'll focus on four metros, including Johannesburg. We can only contest municipalities with a very strong sense that we'll make an impact. He said if his party was unable to secure an outright win, he was prepared to form a coalition. We will not work with the ANC in any given situation, says Mashaba. Well, we'll see what happens with Herman Mashaba, and perhaps I can get him interviewed on this channel in the future. We'll take a look at that. But uh, very disappointing, his actions two years ago. And I don't even know if Action SA is registered as a political party at this stage. If not, they better get moving fast. He said it wasn't a political party. It's just an idea. That's what he said originally. So apparently he's changed his view on that. And now, as I predicted, Action SA would be eventually registered as a political party and not simply a, just a movement. Meanwhile, the city of Johannesburg seeks to untether itself from the unreliable electricity supplier, the national parastatal ESCOM in a move by another major metropolitan city in South Africa to disconnect from the grid. Joe Berg, Africa's dominant financial center, wants to meet 35% of its energy needs from renewable sources by 2030 and will seek proposals for privately supplied power by August of this year. With a population of over 5 million, it's looking for its own power suppliers after the government last year said municipalities could buy electricity from companies other than state power utility ESCOM. The move would reduce the reliance on ESCOM, which has subjected the country to periodic power outages for over 13 years because of unreliable generation. And I can finish that sentence by saying corruption, patronage, and outright theft, as well as incompetence and racism, chasing away qualified minority engineers and hiring unqualified replacements. But also an opportunity for climate change combating, as almost all of ESCOM's power is generated by burning coal. Well, we shall see. But it makes sense to see Johannesburg break away from the grid. And in fact, um, the South African government ought to, and I encourage them to get rid of the rules that favor this inept pay state uh, company and allow private competition to take place for all electricity. The reason they don't allow it is because ESCOM will be obliterated by a functional, efficient, private supplier of electricity. Plus, they'll have to share the transmission lines, and they don't like that concept. Meanwhile, the financial mail is uh, trying to put lipstick on a pig. That's right, talking about the Heineken bid for Distel in the concept that this is a vote of confidence for South Africa's economy, which is far better than the naysayers would like you to believe. Let me tell you, it's not that. This is an effort by Heineken to take advantage of Distel's good management and business acumen in expanding their distribution and sales across the continent of Africa. It is a brilliant move by Heineken to get in early on growth across the continent from an established player with Iconic names like Amarulo, Savannah, Hunter's Dry, and Naderborg Wines. That's what Heineken is doing. And they're getting it for a song. Just a few billion U.S. dollars? Give me a break. $31 billion valuation means less than or about $2 billion U.S. for this company. This is not a vote of confidence in South Africa's economy. The abysmal, race-focused, dysfunctional South African economy controlled by a small group of oligarchs and ANC cadre where entrepreneurs are crushed. Yeah, we become so used to looking obsessively at our faults that we often forget that SA companies remain of global interest. Yeah, not for their SA sales. The country might be idled by, idled by shoddy service delivery, but its recent approaches by international companies Volaris and Heineken for control of technology app group 
ADAPT IT and Drinks Group Distillery respectively indicates a high esteem in which South Africa's private sector is held globally. In Heineken's case, the desire to buy the majority of distillers is especially curious. The 57 billion euro group was badly hurt last year by the alcohol bans. Heineken, which sells its eponymous beer here, along with Vintolk and Strongbow, Strongbow Cider, was forced to ice a $6 billion brewery in South Africa given its COVID-linked losses. Now, however, it sees this still as a route to the African market. Exactly right. But the African market, financial mail, not the South African market. They have very little confidence in the South African market with good reason. With good reason. They haven't renewed the $6 billion investment in their facilities in South Africa, that foreign direct investment. They haven't. They're simply buying an established player who has spread its wings across Africa. That's what they care about. Congratulations to Take A Lot, which is 10 years old now, the successor to Kalahari.net which was a pretty good site in the early days of online retailing. But Take A Lot is now 10 years old. Hey, and they are having 10 million in Rand savings every day. What a journey it's been. To celebrate its incredible milestone, South Africa's leading online retailer is hosting the Take A Lot 10th birthday sale. Customers can shop their share of up to 10 million in savings every day through a huge 10-day sale. It's going on right now, folks. Today's day two. Or no, it's not day two, excuse me. It's from the 24th of May it starts. 24 May to 2 June. Each of those days, you stand a chance to win a variety of incredible daily prizes. TVs, iPads, kitchen appliances, and headphones are all up for grabs. Simply spend at least 500 Rand of products that are on a special on the day as part of the sale, and you become entered in the contest. Take a lot turns 10, and you get a chance to profit and benefit from it. So if you shop at Take a Lot, pay attention 24 May to 2 June, your chance to take home prizes and get good deals. Meanwhile, in Zimbabwe, the government is hoping to make $709 million U.S. off of bumper maize crop. Seek 60 billion Zim in private funding to buy grain. They want to buy this grain, so they want people to step in. We've set up various structures, a grain purchase committee and a grain payment committee that include various producer associations to work on strategies to ensure that resources are in place to pay the farmers. And Kube said in a parliament in response to questions whether the Treasury has the finances to buy the 2.8 million tons of corn from producers. Well, here's the story. The government doesn't have the money. They won't have the money. So what's going to happen here? Is this grain going to rot? Is it going to go to waste? Or more likely, the price of maize will be reduced to such a low level because of the oversupply of grain. We shall see. Meanwhile, also in Southern Africa, Namibia has abstained on a vote from the Responsibility to Protect Resolution, which is being promoted as an anti-genocide resolution, when in reality, the Responsibility to Protect is a international liberal viewpoint that countries have a responsibility to protect innocents who are under a threat from their own governments when governments don't protect them or other factors. Now, Namibia abstained because they say this gives large, powerful countries unconstrained right to intervene in internal issues in other countries and can be, mismute, can be abused. Well, I have to, have to agree with Namibia. It, it very much is the case. Now, I am famously known and quoted as saying that I don't believe in the responsibility to protect. I believe in the right to protect, by which I mean powerful international actors have the right to intervene in a place where genocide is taking place. Absolutely. That's my view. That's a very liberal view from a very conservative former military officer, retired colonel. The right to intervene the right to protect is different than the responsibility to protect. But of course, this came about because of the horrific things that took place in Rwanda in 1994, in Bosnia in 1992, as the world sat back and allowed countless lives to be butchered and lost and did nothing. The United Nations was useless. The Organization of African Unity was useless. And as a consequence of this, this concept of the Responsibility to protect came about. Namibia has decided to abstain in this vote, and I do not criticize them for that. Namibia abstained from voting on the adoption of the United Nations resolution of the Responsibility to Protect and the Prevention of Genocide, War Crimes, Ethnic Cleansing, and Crimes Against Humanity at the end of this General Assembly this week. It was one of the countries that abstained while 115 voted in favor and 15 voted against. The Responsibility to Protect would be included in the annual agenda of the General Assembly, and the Secretary General will be formally requested to report on the topic annually. The resolution states that prevention remains crucial and atrocity prevention should be integrated into all relevant fields of work of the United Nations. Now, Vintok Mayer uh, from an opposition party, that's Job Amapanda, who recently became mayor in elections la late last year, criticized Namibia for not voting for adopting a resolution seeing that Namibia suffered one of the worst genocides in history. Well, that's debatable. Namibia did not suffer one of the worst genocides in history. The Herero people suffered one of the worst genocides in history with upwards of 75 of the population, 90,000, 75,000 killed during the conflict, which they initiated against Germans. Namibia didn't suffer 
There were 10,000 Nama also killed, approximately. But Namibia didn't suffer the one of the worst genocides. Cambodia suffered one of the worst genocides. Rwanda suffered one of the worst genocides ever. Not just in sheer numbers, but in the impact on the country and the population. Yeah, it did suffer genocide. The Herero people did, and the Nama people suffered greatly. But Namibia as a country did not. That's a misstatement. You need to learn a little bit about history there, Job. He said, stating is tantamount to voting against such a resolution. What a scandal for a country that witnessed one of the first genocides of the 20th century and any relationship power dynamics are always determined. If an elephant standing on the tail of a mouse, abstinence means standing on the side of the elephant, he said in his Twitter account. Deputy Prime Minister and National Relations Minister uh, Natawa said NBB has more concern with the responsibility to protect aspect of the resolution. She said it would mean powerful countries can abuse their power by intervening militarily when there's a conflict in a specific country, as was the case in Libya. She added, Namibia does not condone genocide and ethnic cleansing, but was against the right to protect aspect. It's a very dangerous resolution. Powerful countries can always invade countries where there's unrest under the guise of the right to protect. And indeed, she is correct. She's 100% correct. And the Swapo government, for once, got something right. I'll have to commend them on this. Absolutely. Meanwhile, the African Union sits on its hands and walks away limp-wristed after a group went to Njimini to investigate the situation after the death of Idris Debe. The unlawful installation of his son as Mamat Debe as the president under military government for 18 months. It took longer than expected to examine Chad's situation. However, on the 14th of May, the African Union's Peace and Security Council finally decided not to impose the sanctions against Njimina and the transitional authorities led by General Mamat Idris Debe. In fact, Chad has been threatened with sanctions ever since his military transition government was established following the death, but nothing has happened. And that's unfortunate. It sends a message to Chad that its actions are acceptable when they're not. There should be an election for the people of Chad. That's what should be happening, not this nonsense. Meanwhile, congratulations to Cameroon on its national day. Today, the 20th of May, 2021. On behalf of the government of the United States, I congratulate the people of the Republic of Cameroon as you celebrate National Day on the 20th of May. The United States looks forward to continued cooperation with Cameroon to advance commitments to human rights, good governance, dialogue, and peace on this special occasion. I wish peace and prosperity for all Cameroonians in the year ahead. On est ensemble. And that from Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, released from the Department of State today. This is a pro facto so a pro forma sort of thing that happens for every national day. It's a frequent situation we do here. Meanwhile, the uh, Uganda Airlines, barely two years old, apparently is plagued by scandal and mismanagement, according to the Africa Report, a subsidiary of Jeune Afrique magazine. Uganda Airlines stalling due to scandals and mismanagement. Barely two years old, Uganda Airlines launched a few months before the virus pandemic, grounded flights worldwide, but insiders say the current malaise is, runs far deeper with allegations of nepotism, corruption, prompting experts to worry the same fate awaits this latest iteration of Uganda Airlines as hit its predecessor. Can the government pull up before it's too late? I do not think so. My prognosis for Uganda Airlines is grim. That is a country full of pervasive corruption, and I don't see any great prospects for this airline. In fact, it's not really much of an argument to have an airline in a country that small, but I suppose um, they think it's important. They could do it being a regional carrier, but that would be the extent of its capacity to make any money. Flying to Juba, flying to Nairobi, even Kigali perhaps, but that's about the extent of where it can make any money. Beyond that, it can't compete. Meanwhile, the United States has condemned in the harshest terms the appointment of former warlord responsible for the death of Samuel Doe as the head of the Senate Armed Forces Committee in Liberia. Prince Johnson has been selected for that position, a long-time member of that body. He, in fact, was a member of it in 2008 when I had to testify before the Liberian Senate Armed Services Committee about the commissioning of the second batch of lieutenants in the Armed Forces Library, the AFL. The U.S. Embassy strongly condemns the election yesterday of notorious warlord Prince Y. Johnson as chair of Liberian Senate Committee on Defense and Intelligence. Senator Johnson's gross human rights violations during Liberia's civil wars are well documented. His continued efforts to protect himself from accountability, enrich his own coffers, and sow division are also well known. That the Liberian Senate would see fit to elevate him to a leadership role, particularly in the area in which he has done this country the most harm, creates doubts as to the seriousness of the Senate as a steward of Liberia's defense and security. Ooh, shots fired. The U.S. government is proud of our longstanding partnership with the Ministry of National Defense and Armed Forces of Liberia, which will continue, but we can have no relationship with Senator Johnson. We note as well the continuation of Counselor Varney Sherman, sanctioned by the U.S. Department of Treasury for corruption involving judiciary bribery as chair of the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, Human Rights, Claims, and Petitions. By giving Senators Johnson and Sherman these leadership roles, the Senate is effectively ensuring that corruption and lack of accountability flourish. The United States is condemned in a strongly worded statement 
the, the nomination of notorious former librarian warlord Prince Johnson to a top defense post and said it would not have any relationship with him in this new job. Johnson, according to this report from Yahoo News, said Johnson, a brutal figure in Liberia's first civil war from 89 97, was elected head of the Librarian Senate Committee on Defense and Intelligence on Tuesday. Failed presidential candidate center is a 60 year old. Eight-year-old sent shockwaves around the world for brutality after video showed him calmly sipping beer while his men tortured former President Samuel Doe to death, including castrating him. Johnson is accused of war crimes, mass killings, and torture, but has never been brought to justice. The United States, a traditional ally of Liberia, Africa's oldest republic founded by former U.S. slaves and free blacks, published a trenchant statement on Wednesday evening slamming Johnson's appointment. As I said, he's been on the committee for a long time. Now he's been elevated to chairman. New Deal. Special drawing rights, debt, and vaccines. What happened when he merged from the summit on financing African economies? It's the New Deal. So more handouts for Africa. The summit aimed to find ways to boost the African economy. Emmanuel Macron, president of France, received 21 heads of state and government from the continent and said discussions enable the launch of a profound dynamic. <laughs> Nonsense. But the final results fall short of a New Deal for Africa as no reallocation of IMF special drawing rights was agreed. Indeed, of the $650 billion of special drawing rights that would be released by the International Monetary Fund, only $33 billion was released to Africa. So what new deal are we talking about? More hot water and palava and nonsense being spoken about by politicians who really are not making a difference. And the obsequious African leaders from the DRC and elsewhere who are licking Macron's boots, dear Emmanuel, dear Emmanuel. No, stop it. Stop it. Grow your economies. Stop your government intrusion into the marketplace. End corruption. Prosecute criminals. Educate your citizens properly, not rote memorization and nonsense. Teach them to think critically, to make them literate in their own language and in English, and your country will soar. Do otherwise, and you'll remain at the begging table. Please, sir, more soup. It's pathetic. Grow up, Africa. You've had 70 years. It's well past time. For the few countries in Africa that have grown up, Rwanda, Mauritius, Botswana, Cape Verde, Morocco, congratulations to you. But even those countries face challenges with pervasive poverty, with the exception of Mauritius. So what's happening in the Spanish enclave of Ceuta in North Africa? Well, criminal alien invaders have poured across and into this, and it's created a row between Spain and Morocco. Of course, they want to get in so that they can slip into Europe. Sudden influx of migrants. Mig they're not migrants. They're criminal alien invaders from Morocco into Ceuta caught Spanish authorities off guard amid diplomatic tensions between Spain and Morocco. What's well, not? Don't catch them off guard. Load them in boats. Drop them back on the Moroccan side. Case closed. A migrant is comforted by a Spanish Red Cross member near the border of Morocco and Spain. 8,000 migrants illegally entered Ceuta, a Spanish swath of territory boarding Morocco on the North African coast, starting on the 17th of May, taking them by surprise. Spain sent in the army and more police forces tightened the border controls, then began mass expulsion of those who entered, among them families and minors. The influx happened to tide of heightened tensions between Spain and Morocco. Migrants from Africa are trying to reach Europe by the same route in search of a better life. Well, fix your countries. Fix your countries. That's a better life. In Burkina Faso, the continued violence by extremists is putting education and children at risk who can't attend school. It's not the pandemic that's the problem, although that is a challenge. The real challenge, apparently, is the continuing violence, the escalation of violence in poor Burkina Faso, who didn't see this conflict coming and was ill-prepared and ill-equipped to fight it. In Burkina Faso, skyrocketing violence puts children's education on hold. They told the headmaster he should be teaching in Arabic. They said French is not the language of Islam. A new school term began in Burkina Faso this month, but not for many children living in areas affected by the conflict. Their education is on hold yet again. United Nations Refugee Agency, the UNHCR, warned this month of an unprecedented humanitarian emergency in the West African country of roughly 20 million people as Al-Qaeda and so-called Islamic State-linked groups who are opposed to secular education step up attacks. The spiraling unrest has displaced 267,000 people since last July and over a million overall since it began. All of Burkina Faso's 13 regions are now hosting people who have fled the violence, which UN agencies said is devastating the country's agriculture and rural economy and leaving children with life-threatening malnutrition. The impact has been particularly severe on the already weak education system with more than 2,000 schools forced to close by the end of late last year and 330,000 students out of class. Some schools have been lit on fire by jihadists whose threats have forced teachers into hiding and convinced many parents that their children are better off staying at home. This is a crisis that the world has largely ignored, ladies and gentlemen. The world has paid no attention to what's happening in Burkina Faso and shame on you all, all you political cowards who ignore 
this horrific violence taking place in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Niger, in Mauritania, in Chad, in Nigeria. And shame on the African Union, which has no answers for this whatsoever. Shame on the Manchurian cadaver in Washington, D.C. Shame on Emmanuel Macron, who pretends of a new deal for Africa while people can't even go to school. The British Broadcasting Corporation has apologized for its deceitful methods <laughs> to secure an interview with Princess Diana. Hmm. BBC has offered an unconditional apology after a report found a prominent journalist used deceitful methods to secure a landmark interview with Princess Diana as her marriage broke down. BBC journalist Martin Bashir conducted the career-defining interview with Diana in 1995 in which she detailed her breakdown. While the BBC cannot turn back the clock after a quarter of a century, we can make a full and un unconditional policy, apology. A report written by former judge Lord Dyson found that Bashir had shown fake bank statements to Diana's brother Charles Spencer, which deceived and induced him to arrange a meeting with Diana. By gaining access to Princess Diana's way, Bashir was able to persuade her to agree to give the interview. He's long been alleged to use forged documents. Well, and he made a career of that. What a deceitful, slimy, scumbag piece of dirtbag. Is there no way to prosecute him? I guess after 25 years, the statute of limitations run out. But this sort of behavior is rife through international media outlets like the British Broadcasting Corporation and others around the world. We see it all the time. We see the Columbia Broadcasting Service, CBS News, repeatedly running stories by Dan Blather, also known as Dan Rather, that were wholly made up, complete fiction, about the National Guard Service, the Air Guard Service of former President George Walker Bush, just made the entire story up and was caught red-handed. Yet he's still an esteemed newsman. Utter nonsense. Yeah, this fraud by the media is disgraceful. And this is why people don't trust the media. No one's trustworthy. You can't trust any of them. This is why people, unless the tube censors content, look for independent journalists and broadcasters who bring the news with objective analysis and facts and are honest about their personal bias. Like me. <laughs> BBC caught red-handed. Not a surprise. Meanwhile, ladies and gentlemen, in the Major League Rugby action this past weekend in D.C., Old Glory gains a home win over Seattle Seawolves. This article by none other than Chris Wyatt from Rugby Ascendant. Heartbreaking last-second loss in Utah last week where Old Glory fell to the Utah Warriors 34-33 was a tough pill to swallow, particularly after such an inspired performance and the long journey to the Beehive State. But this past weekend, D.C. was at home in front of a pandemic-constrained but incredibly supportive crowd and taking on a struggling Seattle Seawolves team which has been decimated by injuries. The result was Old Glory coming out on top in an exciting 22-18 game at Sager Field in Leesburg, Virginia, with four players earning a spot on the Major League Rugby Geico Top 15 Performers of the Week list. And let's listen to an interview now from Kios Lensing, the forwards coach from the Seattle Seawolves. Let's hear what Kios has to say about the game that took place at Leesburg. Uh, Kios Lensing uh, coaching with Seattle Seawolves. And uh, we were talking earlier about uh, some of the challenges you face this season with uh, the season no preseason, players not really fit across the league. That's a real challenge for, for clubs. In addition, a lot of injuries early on. But now you head back home. Most of the rest of the season is at home. It looks like players are starting to get fit, although you're missing a number of your players. How do you feel about your chances for the second half? It's been a tough first half for the Seawolves. I'm very positive. I definitely think we, when we go back home, we're going to have the, uh, the supporters behind us. And and we're definitely going to be a better team back home. And we're going to put this games that's so close to not finishing them out. We're going to finish them out at home because we're going to have the supporters there. We're going to have the, the, the players are going to be want to play in front of their families. They want to play in front of the, the Seawolf crowd. And, and I'm very positive about going home the last bit of the season. Well, that's definitely one thing that no one can complain about. The fan support in Seattle has been off the charts since the inception of the club, and no doubt that 16th uh, player there has got to be a big bonus to carry you guys for the rest of the season. No, definitely. No, the Seattle supporters are unbelievable supporters, very loud, uh, very enthusiastic, and, and we owe them as well also. We need to change this season around, and I know we can do it when we go back home. All right, best of luck the rest of the season, Kios. Thank you so much. And that was Kios Lensing from the Seattle Seawolves uh, on their loss this weekend in Leesburg to Old Glory DC, who, despite remaining at the bottom of the log in the Eastern Conference, closed the gap. They're now within just four points of second place with 20 points on the log. For Seattle, it's a bit tougher slog. They have just 12 points and are very far behind the 7-1 conference-leading Los Angeles squad, an expansion team in Major League Rugby this year. 
Folks, those are the news, the headlines and the news and analysis from today, the 20th of May, 2021. Thank you for your patronage here on Indaba Africa News of the Day. We appreciate your support for Chris White Africa. Thank you very much. As independent journalism is consistently under attack, we seek to make a difference in the world by bringing objective, independent analysis from people that actually know what the hell they're talking about, not simply talking heads who put on makeup and sit in front of a camera and have never done anything except get their university degree and sit in front of a camera. Well, thank you very much, folks. Uh, appreciate your support. We'll catch you here next time on Indaba Africa News of the Day.